audiobook, Simply This Moment. 20 The Ending of Everything, 1. 7th of December 2005. Of those things that arise from a cause. The Tathagata has told the cause. And also what their cessation is. This is the doctrine of the great recluse. This verse was the teaching that Venerable Asajji gave to Sariputta. When we went to India recently we saw that verse in all the ancient Buddhist monasteries. We saw it written on old seals, pottery, and in many other places. It was a very popular early teaching, almost a definition of the Buddha's teachings. Perhaps it was even more essential than the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. It was a statement of the Dhamma of the Buddha, and as such it finds its beginnings in the words of one of the first five disciples of the Buddha. Before he became a disciple of the Buddha, Sariputta saw a monk with such serene features that he wanted to ask who the monk's teacher was and what were his teachings. So he approached Venerable Asajji. That verse was the answer Asajji gave to Sariputta. Those words were so powerful that straight away Vn Sariputta, with his great mind, was able to penetrate them and become a stream. Winner The subject matter of this evening's talk is the question, what does ye dhamma? Hedapabhavatesam hedam tathagato aharili mean? The Buddha taught the cause of all things, the way they originate, and also their ceasing. As a result of that Sariputta attained the insight of all stream winners, Yam. Kinsi Samudayadamam Sabam Tam Nirodadamanti, whatever has the nature to arise, all that has the nature to cease. What does that actually mean? The reason I am talking about this now is because in some of the discussions I had on my tour of the United States there was much talk about such things. As many of you will know, the Christians in the United States have been forcing the issue of what they call intelligent design, wanting to explain the origin of this universe as God-caused. Because they are running the debate in the U.S. and they have a huge influence there. They are deceiving many people. Because of that, as a Buddhist monk traveling in that country, I was often asked about the Buddha's response to this and in particular, people wanted to know the Buddhist view with regard to the origins of the world. Christians are often very materialistically minded, only seeing nature as basically the four elements. The result of that is to not really understand or include the nature of the mind. So, often the debate is just on material things. But I'm going to extend it beyond that, into the mind into the nature of the mind. As a physicist before I became a monk, the one thing that I do know is that the nature of form, what we call the four elements, is that it is empty of everything. As many of you would know, the mat that you sit on is not solid, it is made up of atoms and 99.9999% space, it's mostly empty. And if you could look inside that atom you would see that it is just this smear of potential places where electrons can be found. It is basically empty, there is just a tiny speck in the middle called a nucleus. When you look into that nucleus you find that it is full of holes as well. Basically there is nothing there except fields of energy. There is nothing really solid, just the emptiness of phenomena. Scientists would agree with that straight away. The reason I bring this up is because when people talk about the creation of the material universe, they usually say, how on earth can you create something out of nothing? It's a valid point, because in fact you can't create something out of nothing. That's why people think there has to be some sort of creator, a of God figure, to make that irrational jump from nothing into something. The point I am making is that, because there is nothing in this material world to begin with, just these plays of energy, it's just an illusion. It is just a wrong way of thinking, a culturally induced delusion, to think of things as being solid and to think that there is actually matter here. 
the four elements are just ways of perceiving. As many scientists know, sanata, the emptiness of any essence, of any solidity, or thingness in the matter which we see and feel, is an established fact of science. Because there is nothing actually here, the arising of this universe out of nothing becomes plausible. Sure, something cannot come out of nothing, but a zero sum, rise and fall, can come out of nothing and that is what this universe is. I use that as an example so that you can understand what that famous saying of a Sajji means. Whatever arises, that causal arising out of nothing, can also cease into nothing. You realize there is nothing here to begin with. As you probe into it, you penetrate the illusion of a self, a soul, an entity, in the five khandas of being, just as a physicist probes into matter and takes it apart, analyzes it, and sees that there is nothing substantial there. The four elements are anatta, non-self, the sense of atta being an essence, a thing in itself, something persisting which is always there, that is impossible. It's basically a delusion to think that there is something in this universe which is solid and persistent, which will be there forever and ever. Scientists have proved that again and again, and it's really irrational and untenable to believe. Otherwise, of course, when we start looking into our mind at the five khandas, emptiness is what we are also expected to see, and it is something Sarah put us off straight away. Origination from nothing is just an empty process, and because it is an empty causal process it is also subject to cessation, to disappearing, to vanishing, to going back to an original source, if you want to say that. Emptiness to begin with, emptiness in the end, anything else becomes completely irrational and untenable. Even the idea of an eternal consciousness that doesn't change, is tantamount to being no consciousness at all. Vina A or consciousness needs change, needs some contrast to give it life, as any psychologist would know. This is rational. You have to know from your own experience that whatever is stable disappears, you cannot see it, perceive it, or know it, because the nature of knowing is contrast or discrimination. Now, this might just be words, but the practice of our meditation reveals the truth of what I've just said. To see things disappear is the very heart of the meditation process. When we say to calm things, it means to calm things to the point of disappearance. The Buddha once said that Nibbana is Sabsaskara Simatha, the quietening of all the formations, that is, the calming all of the movements and all of the makings. Everything is calm down to absolute stillness. Of course, people might have some theories about what stillness is, but the experience in the jhanas when the mind starts to experience deep states of stillness, shows that stillness means that things disappear. As many of you here know, I learned my first Pali from the Vinaya and I value that study. I was forced to do it because in the early years of our tradition very few monks knew the Vinaya and there were some silly things being done by us. We thought we were being strict according to the Vinaya, but in fact we didn't really understand what we were doing and we had no real guidance. The book available at that time, the Vinaya Mukha, was a brave attempt, but it was written by a prince of Thailand who in fact got many things wrong. And since he was royalty, no one was willing to question it and so the mistakes lasted for over a century and they are still there. I learned to read Pali from the Vinaya. That's a wonderful place to start to learn Pali. Because in the Vinaya you see the common usage of those words in the down-to-earth practical actions of life, which is what the Vinaya is all about. It's not theories, it's what people actually do, and there you have the ground of language. All language starts with the world of seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, and tasting. It then gets 
adapted to the metaphysical world of thoughts and theories, ideas and philosophies. Even religious philosophies. When you ground your understanding of language in the physical world that is where you find the deeper meanings, and then you can apply those meanings to the metaphysical stuff. In the Vinaya I came across the seven Adhikara Asamitha. Dhamma is at the very end of the Paramokkha rules, and I gain the understanding that to Samitha things means to deal with them and settle them so that they are not business anymore. They are dealt with and they disappear from your agenda. They literally vanish, they are not there anymore. That's how I understood the word Samitha and also the word Apasama because the two are used synonymously in that section of the Vinaya. That understanding of the meaning of those words in ordinary usage gave me the insight into what the path of meditation is. It is to calm all the business down, to settle it, so that it all disappears. You can see that the idea of settling things into disappearance, into Naroda, into cessation, is the whole theme of our monastic life. Sure, we build huts in order to Settle the problem of accommodation, so the problem is finished, dissolved, and we don't have to do that anymore. We build our halls so that we don't have to do that anymore. We eat our one meal of the day so that for the rest of the day we don't have to do it anymore. It's all about calming, settling the business of our lives, so we can all disappear, so that we have no business to do. When we settle things down, it means the business disappears. I spend a lot of time settling other people's business. I settled some funeral business. This afternoon, a person dies, we do the ceremony, and then we don't have to think about it anymore. Unfortunately, some people create business. As a monk I try not to make more business, but often other people make that business for me. So settling business is my duty as the senior monk. But I look to those early years when I made very little business, the years when I could just sit down and meditate without having anything to think about or anything to worry about. I understood what progress I could make in my meditation by doing hardly anything at all, by living simply, not making business, doing projects, or writing letters. I even neglected my family, the first time I visited them was after seven years as a monk. I didn't write to my friends, except maybe once a year at Christmas. Simplifying my life meant I was Samadhan, calming, lessening, and quelling all the business of my life. I understood that the path of being a monk was that of a renunciant, living outside of the world, not worrying about what other people think of you not even your family. That's not what should run your life as a monk. What runs your life as a monk is something else, it is the ability to leave the world and not engage in it, not to make your life more complicated but to simplify it. This is one of the things that I stress to each one of you. If you live in this monastery your life is only as complicated as you make it. And your success in meditation will be inversely proportional to your complexity. How many things are you doing and what do you spend your time on? Because we take on responsibility some of us have to deal with complexity. Many of you do not. You make it for yourselves. Be careful, Samitha things. And things, don't start things. I remember a John Chalway said he liked the ending of things, never the starting. Of things. So see if you can end as much as possible. Don't end one project and start. 2. End one project and start none. Be a simple living person who does very little. The only project that you have to do is to come out in the morning, do your chores, eat, and then go back to your hut and literally end things. That is the path of being a monk. When you find that path and you practice this idea of samithaing things, quelling things, renouncing things, you find that things disappear. You are experiencing a vanishing in your life, a vanishing of concerns for the world.
Often people are too concerned with their families. That is an attachment, an obstacle. It's okay to look after your families to some extent, but in your early years, try to move away as much as possible, to cut them off, in other words you say no for a while. I have done that for many years, and it's wonderful to be free of my family. Even when I visited them there was no attachment for my mother, or my brother, or anybody else. If they die tomorrow my faculties will not change. If they died right now I would never be sad. This is detachment. And it is wonderful to be able to see that in a person. When I went to visit them recently, I was at ease with these things. They have lived good lives but they are going to die one day. So, there is a quelling and calming of the business of your family duties. There is a quelling of the other things you want to achieve in life. What do you want to achieve but calm, peace, emptiness, stillness, and things disappearing, because if the objects of your mind don't disappear you won't disappear. You are what you do. You are your projects. That is what makes this idea of a self and gives rise to more scissora, more wanderings, again and again and again. If you want that you are just asking for Dukkha, again and again and again. As the great era and said, it's only Dukkha. Arising and Dukkha passing away, nothing more than that. Don't add more to what? The great era and said, because that's all there is, Dukkha arising and Dukkha passing away, nothing more. See if you can allow Dukkha to finish once and for all, so that there is nothing left. Uparise as a Nibbana, Nibbana with nothing remaining. I am just quoting the suttas here, they are the final reference of our tradition. We understand this because the more we follow the teaching of calming things down, of simplifying, the more things vanish and the more peace and happiness we experience. There is a beautiful quote from the Jataka tales that, although it is found nowhere else in the suttas, fits in so well with what the Buddha said elsewhere, as well as fitting one's experience. The Buddha said that the more you abandon the five senses the more you experience sukha, happiness. If you want to have complete sukha, akanta sukha, you have to abandon the five senses completely. What the Buddha is saying here is not just about subduing the senses when you sit cross-legged, it's actually about letting go of the these things at all times in your life, disengaging from the world of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. What other people say is only sound, that's all. No need to argue with it, no need to get involved in it, no need to think, that's a nice sound. The correct dhamma is that it's just sound and that's all. Please let it go. Don't involve yourself with that world. Don't involve yourself with the world of tastes, beautiful coffee or tea, too hot or too sweet, nice food or not. So nice food. It's just a lot of suffering. What's the point of trying to find the nicest food? It just leads to a lot of suffering. You put it in your mouth and eat it, gobble it down. If you have a choice that's fine. But if you haven't any choice just eat what you've got. It's only a couple of seconds of taste and then it's all gone. What's the big thing about desiring food? The desire for food lasts for such a long time before you eat it but the actual experience is just a few minutes, and then it's all gone. It's all just delusion, make-believe, and anticipation, that's all desire for food really is. It is the same with the coffee. Afterwards, in fact you do not really taste the coffee anyway, you are all talking to each other. So what's the point, you could have rubbish coffee and you wouldn't. No. You're not mindful of what you are drinking. The point of all this is that we should try to abandon this sensory world. Even the jokes and all that talking is just sound, that's all. Someone tells a funny story or a lively story but it's just sound. The more you abandon the five sense world and the body, 
the more happiness you get. What we are doing is calming the five sense world. When we are speaking we don't speak loudly, or harshly, or hurriedly. We speak softly, calmly, almost to the point that sound disappears. We move softly, calmly, and slowly, so that we almost disappear. The whole monastery goes calmly and slowly, so there is nothing left. We've built our huts and our walking paths and now they disappear. That's what they are there for. As it says in the reflections on using your huts, it's just for the enjoyment of solitude, Pataiza Anakamiyaga, solitude and calmness for the practicing of Sumatha. Eventually, sitting in your hut, your hut just disappears from your consciousness. You are not there to look at your hut and make it look beautiful, you just have to keep it clean enough for it to disappear from your consciousness. You eat enough for the idea of food to disappear from you. Consciousness. You wear robes or a blanket if you are cold, so that the whole idea of clothing disappears from your consciousness. You do it for the sake of disappearance. That's what we mean by the path of calming, the path of emptiness and disappearing. We do reflections on the body, the body contemplations. Why? Why is that an important meditation? It has a purpose. The purpose is for your body to disappear, so that it's Samitha Ed, so that it's not a problem anymore. In fact it just disappears from your agenda. That's the purpose of doing body contemplation. If you can't sit down and get into jhanas, which are the sign that the body has disappeared with its five senses, there is still some holding in there. You are still attached to the body. You still can't let it go. It's fascinating to see why you can't get into a jhana. It's not through lack of effort. It's not through not putting in the hours. The hours are important but that's not the crucial thing. Sometimes people can meditate for their whole lifetime, 8 hours, or 10 hours a day, and still not get into these states. Why? It's because there is still something they are unwilling to let go of, unwilling to renounce, and because they are unwilling to let go and renounce it, it never disappears. They just cannot samatha it. They can't calm it down into disappearance. So, this is why the more we understand the emptiness of these phenomena, what we call the material world, the more we see that there is so much that we add on to what we see, so much we add on to what we hear. I was talking earlier this evening about the cultural conditioning that we have, because I have received a paper from some scientist about the nature of what used to be called Davalites. They have a scientific explanation, they are just phenomena with causes and effects, they are not devas, they are not heavenly beings. But it's amazing how people want to add on these heavenly beings. I was reading newspaper while waiting for the funeral this afternoon. I only half read the article, but some scientist had with great effect been debunking all these weeping virgins and blood coming out of statues in Catholicism, by finding a good explanation for it. Nevertheless, even though there is a fascinating and good explanation, if people want to believe, they will add on to the experience what they want to see. This is the problem, our attachments to ideas and views stop us from seeing the truth. There is a famous story from the early years of Wat Pa Pong, when Ajahnja was a young monk. On the day in the week when everyone goes to the monastery, this man was coming to the monastery in his car but the rain was pouring down and he got stuck in the mud. He was worried about how he was going to get to the monastery because it was raining so hard. He wasn't willing to get out of the car and get wet himself, but then he saw a John Cha coming out of the forest, a John Che, this great monk with such humility got behind the car and pushed it out of the mud. Ajahn Cha's robes were all wet and muddy, and his face was splattered with mud. He thought, ah, that's what you call a great monk. 
it doesn't matter how much respect he has got in the neighborhood, he is willing to give an ordinary layperson a push in the mud, even though he is going to get all wet and dirty. That's a real monk, not like some of these monks who sit up there and expect to be treated like kings or royalty. This guy was so impressed. When he got to the hall just one or two minutes later, he saw the Paramokka being recited with a John Cha sitting in the middle, dry with no mud on him. Wow! He thought, psychic powers, and I've seen it. Of course many of you know what the true story was. A John Pai tune, a relation of a John Cha who was a novice at the time, looked very similar to a John Cha, and as a novice he wasn't in the Paramokka recitation. He had seen this man coming and being a kind. Monkey pushed the man out of the mud. But because of his physical resemblance to a John Che, in the dark and in the rain, it was enough for this guy to say, no, that was a John Che. And no matter how many times a John Pai Toon has said, that was not a John Che, that was me, this guy never accepts it, and he will never admit that he was wrong. He wants a miracle so much and that's the miracle he has. That story went all round Yuban. I think it's still part of the history of the great teacher Ajahn. Che. We make so much of things that aren't really there, simply because of belief. That's why in regard to views, no matter where we hear them, we always have to doubt them and challenge them. It doesn't matter which monk says these things, don't believe them. The only thing you can trust is either the suttas or your own experience, not other monks, not me, not any other Kribhajans, nobody, just the suttas and your own experience. If you really want to challenge things you have to be courageous and iconoclastic. Iconoclastic means challenging sacred cows, no matter where they come from. This is how we deepen our experience. When we see what we are attached to, and what those things are, they disappear, they samitha. They only arise from a cause. The causes are delusion, our sense of ego and self, and that's what we protect. When people are challenged they get defensive and angry. That's a sign that we've added a self, a me, to that idea. We've formed the I believe connection that's the cause of so many arguments and of so much obstruction on the path to things disappearing and settling. It's important to have some degree of right view in order to attain jhanas. Without right view it's difficult to get jhanas simply because there is something that one keeps holding on to, that one attaches to as me, as mine. Because of that one is unwilling to abandon and let go to the point of entering jhanas. A lot of times the attachment comes from wrong view, there is an I in there somewhere, a self, a me, holding onto something. I've explained before that attachment is like a hand. The hand has two ends to it, the end which grasps and the end which initiates the grasping. One of the greatest insights that helped me on the path was not to look at the end that grasps but to look at the end that initiates the grasping. That is, not to look at what I was grasping but at who or what was doing that grasping. When you look at that, then you can actually unravel grasping. It's always the mind doing this, the me, the ego, the self, it is the mind that wants to exist. The craving to be, bhavadaha, is holding on to things and making things exist. When you strike down that idea, that view, the opposite is true. The less self you have, the more things are allowed to disappear. The more you can renounce, the more things disappear. You can renounce, the more things disappear. You can renounce, the more things disappear. You can renounce, the more things 